leave you for just a second let my dog out. Let the dog out! <laughs> Belda's Come, I was going to say, coming in with a presence there, Belda. <laughs> Ryan and I reconnected here through Nadine Tanner, who I love dearly. And so we talked Ryan into coming on and, and speaking today. So glad to have you, Ryan. Yeah, he Looking looks familiar. So I worked for as a Department of Defense contractor teaching all throughout the U.S. and then since I've been with Carbon Black, I've done a lot of our conferences and a lot of our webinars and other things. We have a group that we call the Howlers, which are like the security experts, the security lead that do a lot of conferences, a lot of talks, presentations. Uh, so I've done Black Hat, been there. That might be where. But I'm the guy who wears bow ties all the time. So that's yeah. usually the trademark is if somebody <laughs> sees me, it's, it's the guy who wears a bow tie. Yeah. This is not a clip on, correct? No, no, this is actually my wife made. So she ended up nice. finding, we had a friend who he also wears bow ties. And so for Christmas, she asked him what he wants. And he was like, I want a Ghostbusters bow tie with Ecto Green like on it. So she ended up finding the material, making it on the pattern. So most of my truly nerd bow ties are made by my, my wife. That's awesome. So it's good that she supports you. I know. Well, she's the one who started it all. So when I was training and I was going somewhere for two weeks, three weeks at a time, she's like, you're just the trainer who just everybody sees and then you like forgets about it as soon as you leave. You need something to be memorable by. So one day she brought me half a tie. I'm like, I don't know what I do with half a tie. I know how to tie a regular tie. I don't know what this thing is. She's like, you need to be different. I'm like, okay. Thus started my bow tie collection. Uh, it took a little while to get over like the, it's not the formal tie look. Uh, but since then, it's kind of become my thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they awesome. definitely rose in popularity. We see a lot more bow ties yeah. in the last couple of years. Uh, we re recently went to a wedding. Um, my nephew got married and it took my, um, my boys and my husband about a half an hour longer to get ready just tying their bow ties. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And the secret is it's the same one that you use for your shoes. For your shoe, yeah. <laughs> it's the same knot, but you're doing it up here really? in a mirror versus yeah. on your foot that you've been trained for years to do. Yeah, if you've never done that before, right? Like, I, I mean, I was probably five when I learned how to tie my shoe, but I remember it taking me a bit <laughs> to get, you know, yeah. cracky. <laughs> and what's funny is, even I, I'm so used to doing it in front of a mirror. If I don't have a mirror, it doesn't look nice. So, like, I even <laughs> need the, the mirror to know how to do it. It's, it's really weird, but it works. You made the comment that you're a geek who's comfortable in a social setting. How did you put, how did you phrase an that? Extra, it, you'll see it on today's presentation. I'm an extroverted nerd. Fully <laughs> will admit, like, I'm a nerd at heart, but I'm an extrovert. So I, I'm like the unicorn of <laughs> not, you know, fitting that. But I will, you know, I have fish. I have all my Nintendo stuff. I'm wearing a Ghostbusters bow tie. Like, I, I am your definition of a nerd. I mean, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a geek. I'm a nerd who never became technical right so i'm a i'm, I'm a non-technical nerd or non-technical geek right and all i can think of is the guy at the at at the end of american pie when he comes up on the on the uh, the concert the band concert and he plays the trombone he plays it really bad and he goes i'm i'm or i'm a member of the or i'm a band i'm a band geek i just never joined the band so i like to think of myself in the same same way I'm 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 the I'm the geek who just never became technical. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. Are you a grandma, Belda? Yeah. I'm becoming a grandma. Did I not tell you? I become a grandma in April. Oh, that's Sweet. so awesome. That's nice. so great. I can't wait. I can't wait oh, so good. <laughs> so the question is, are you going with grandma or is there like some family of like Nana, Grammy, like what do they call? I'll tell you what. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. That was me. That was me. Everyone needs to hear this story. <laughs> <laughs> so I, the story, we're at pre-banter, everybody. So uh -huh. this is not the webcast. We're just chat chatting. What you, the story is I'm going to be a grandma in April. And the question is, is am I going to be grandma? Am I going to be Grammy? Am I going to be Nana? Whatever. So I'm at my son and daughter-in-law's house. And my son is in he he is a farmer right so they're out harvesting and i took dinner down for the whole crew one night and as 
he's walking out the door. We're talking about this whole baby situation. And as he's walking out the door, he says, and you're going to be, you're going to be grandma. And I said, well, yeah. He goes, no, you're not going to be Grammy. You're not going to be Nana. You're not going to be anything but grandma. Got it? <laughs> so that's the story. So I will be grandma. Yeah. Sorry. But whatever, whatever comes out of that kid's mouth is what you're going to be, though. <laughs> like whatever. Yeah. Right. I've decided not to count this year on my age. Mm -mm. I didn't use it. So I'm not going to count it. Mm -hmm. I, I thought counting stopped after 29. It was just 29 plus. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I thought that was the rule. So. <laughs> okay. I'm just no. kidding. I'm totally kidding. I feel like people, we always want to go younger and people are like, eh, you don't really look 29. So my theory is yeah, you got to go yeah. older. You can be like, I'm yeah. 63. And they're like, you yeah. look amazing. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Good idea. Nice. I, I'm looking forward to getting older. I, okay. I keep telling my kids that I can't wait to be the the crotchety old guy sitting on my patio yelling at all the neighborhood kids yeah. for getting on my lawn. <laughs> I'm going to be announcing it next week in our business meeting, but I'll tell you guys, so keep it under wraps. We're doing, it's five years at in Deadwood for Wild West Hack and Fest, so we're kind of doing a big splash. Our theme is Hack to the Past, so it's a Back to the Future type, type um, theme, which I think will be really fun. We have some special surprises, one of those being, I think, Dave Kennedy, y'all know him, just bought a DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think we're, I think we're shipping, having the DeLorean shipped in to be oh one of our page props. Yeah, oh, so it's, it'll be fun. I'm so excited. I can't wait for, oh. for Deadwood. Mm -hmm. you, you need to find the cowboy outfit that he bought in the movie and and do a get up just like that yes. oh yeah that'd be good mm -hmm. that would be fun. <laughs> yeah hopefully we'll all be in character so <laughs> yeah that's that's the plan is everybody you get to pick a character from the movie and and come dressed up if you want law staff to do that i think it's i think it's just going to be a blast to be honest. and um with that ryan i'm going to turn presenter status over to you not the shootest but ryan with the bow tie <laughs> there's there's no take backs <laughs> Like, you took it from me. You can't get it. It's all you now. <laughs> present? So oh, no. That's going to go down real fast. <laughs> all right. Let me. And everyone else. Fine. Yeah. I'm going away. You're going away. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have Ryan Hendricks here, and he is going to be talking to us about securing a remote workforce with technology and training. And we're super excited that Ryan is here to join us. So with that, take it away, buddy. Awesome. Thanks for, for having me here. Just to quickly confirm that you can see my screen and it is the slides. Uh, otherwise, we'll have some work to do. We can confirm. That is correct. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for showing up. I really, truly appreciate it. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to talk about securing a remote workforce with technology and training. I am Ryan Hendricks. And so who is this guy that's talking to you? Well, um, I'm the guy who wears bow ties, as you can see in the picture there supporting my awesome Ghostbusters bow tie today. I come with 16 years of training, management, consultant, content creating experience. Started in the IT world back in 2010. Before that, I was kind of in the intel field in the military. So overall, 16 years of experience. Really, truly, you know, hit the ground running. You know, 2010, couldn't really tell you what an IP address was, how things worked. Started instructing, started training, started learning myself. I've been in everyone's shoes of trying to learn a topic, learn something, and kind of go from there. Um, so I've held multiple different positions, mostly on a training side, but also on a consulting side. Was also asked by a, a great dear friend of mine who you might have been with her talk. Uh, Nadine Tanner was the technical editor for one of her books and have created some of my own content from years ago with Security Plus training. I'm just a guy who's kind of passionate about security, passionate about networking. I currently work for VMware. It's VMware Carbon Black. I've been with Carbon Black for four and a half years. We were acquired by VMware back in October and manage all of the technical content that we use for our courses for delivery. So just really the way I like to talk about it is I'm kind of just an extroverted nerd. One thing you'll note about me is I hate PowerPoint. I hate slides. 
I hate that you have to sit here and just look at them. So I try and spice it up a little bit by writing on them, by doodling on them, by drawing on them, just to keep you a little bit engaged. And also, so it's not just me in a blank screen of slides that never change, never edit. But I'm what I call and refer to as an extroverted nerd. I love things all, you know, nerd to me, it's a term of endearment. And I'm just extroverted. So I have no problem going to talk to people. And some may not have that same type of, of deal. So that's kind of a little bit about me. And let's go ahead and jump into the content. Uh, so on the agenda today, we're really going to talk about three different topics. One, we're going to define office and distributed. Obviously, with 2020 being the year that it is, pretty much discuss what makes it distributed, especially distributed versus remote, because I think there is a difference. And we'll just kind of talk about that a little bit. Then we'll talk about the challenges that we face in a distributed workforce. Uh, what challenges did this bring up? I am very much an engaged presenter, like add comments. I'm in the live chat. So if you have comments or anything, feel free to pop them in there. I'm going to ask for your engagement during this training to keep it during the session to keep it a little bit more engaged. Uh, and then we'll kind of close out with security awareness changes, right? I'm an instructor, a trainer at heart. I believe that everybody should have more information, should be able to understand why things are the way that they are. Uh, we oftentimes in the IT world just tell somebody, we'll just do this. And we don't give them the context as to why, we don't explain why, and they can just simply get that information and it might make their lives a little bit easier. You know, an example that I have is back when I worked with an organization and was told that I was now given access to a share drive that I had to log out and log back in, I didn't know why. And I was like, that seems stupid. Why do I have to log out and log back in? Well, silliness aside, right? It's tied to your token that you get when you authenticate and log into the system. That made perfect sense, even though I was not technical at the time. So we'll talk about some of the different security awareness changes that you might want to implement or you might want to think about as we go into 2021, when most of us are probably gonna have to do our security awareness training again for our nice little checkbox for compliance and kind of get that done and things that you might want to, to focus on. Uh, so defining office and distributed. Um, so obviously we do have this office and this distributed mentality. The office is what most of us started. Um, some of us may have started with in 2020, right? You were still January, February, March, you were still going into the office. You were having your nice long commute, whatever that is for you, jumping in and going into the actual office versus now being in a distributed workforce where everybody is at home or working somewhere else or in some other location or some other place. And really we need to just be able to differentiate one from the other and what that includes. So quick, don't wanna to spend too much time on here. The office, this is mostly on-site personnel. Everybody showing up to the office, everybody coming in. It's mostly non-portable systems. So think desktops, systems that people are logging into. Generally all your server stack, everything else is gonna be there. And typically this has this idea of trusted versus untrusted networks, right? We have this idea of this line of, of demarcation where we have our edge device that is simply blocking everything from the trusted internal to the untrusted external. That's really the difference that we have with both of those is that idea that in the office, we had that barrier. When you walked into that building, when you went into that office location and basically showed up, right? That's where the security guards were. That's where everybody was. That's when you entered the office and everything that came with the office, right? We had our system sitting there. We were able to walk up to it, log into it. Maybe if you're in an organization that had shift work where you might've shared systems with other individuals, you might see that at like a hospital or a medical location or a call center where you don't even have your own system that you're able to, to take basically the difference between those two. So that's really what we started for some of us that had to move to a distributed workforce with in 2020. And what we moved to was this idea that from there, we went to a distributed workforce. Now a distributed workforce is again, mostly remote personnel. This are individuals that are not tied to an office. And the key thing here is they're working from wherever. And 
They also have portable systems. So they have laptops, tablets, whatever it is that you issue out to them. And then there's that dynamic network perimeter. There is no line of demarcation. There's no straight line that we say, this is the trusted internal inside of our trusted network versus external. Everything is untrusted. We have no idea where it's coming from. It's coming from the cloud, getting back into our systems, even if it's coming into the DMZ. Now, the key point I wanted to bring up here, and somebody did ask about it in the live chat, the difference between remote versus distributed. I, I think this goes back to a couple of articles and a couple of organizations that have done so recently, where they've decided that they will be full-time remote work. And to me, that is defining what a distributed team is. It means there is no work that is going to be done at a satellite office, at an office. You can set up shop in your location. What I've seen quite a bit of and is the definition of remote of a lot of employers are offering remote work right now. Uh, but is that right now because of the situation that we're in or does that mean that even when this solves its problem, even when you know whatever happens with COVID and this, that you're gonna go back to the office. And that's one of the items that I've, I've brought up before is, is this a permanent thing or is this, right now everybody supports remote, but as soon as we get back into the swing of things and they have a lease on a building for five years, are we gonna bring everybody back into the office? Because that's completely different. If they're allowing that remote work temporarily, not permanently, not going on for the long run, that is completely different from organization deciding that they're going to be distributed. They don't need offices. They Anybody can set up shop wherever they want to. That to me is the difference between distributed and remote and kind of that difference. All right. Right. And, and somebody did bring up, they are not offering, they were forced to offer. And, and that's, you know, whether it's regulation or what have you that forced their hand at, at making that remote workforce. There are some organizations that have embraced this distributed and are sticking with it. So just want to call that out. Thanks again for the, the comments inside of the live chat. So continuing on from there, let's get out of that distributed versus office and let's talk about some of the challenges that we saw as they came up. So what were some of the challenges that came up when we went to, you know, 2020 hit and we went to a distributed workforce? One of the things that we have to really deal with, and this is a big part of what we are going to see is web-based attacks, phishing, malware, ransomware, all that type of typical malware on the end device, on that endpoint. Um, that is something that because we're no longer in that in, you know, internal trusted network, you're now having that endpoint out wherever, uh, whether that's somebody's home, whether it's a shared office location, whether it's down at the coffee shop, if they support that. Maybe they're going over to a friend's house to work, or maybe they're going over to a family member's to work. Them being able to pick up and go wherever, that now kind of becomes where all this occurs. It's on that endpoint that that individual takes with them. So the endpoint attacks is, is a challenge because anything that we had internal to your organization, inside of your office, whether it was a proxy, filtering, any kind of network-based offerings that might provide any kind of protection, those aren't available anymore, right? This is an individual at their house. You don't have control over their network, their systems. So just bringing up that point that the challenges faced didn't really change with the endpoint. The endpoint challenges are still there. You still have the web-based attacks, you still have phishing, mainly focusing on the things that most end users you know, initiate. I clicked on all the things, I pressed all the buttons, I did all that sort of stuff. That has not changed, right? That has remained. The key difference is what has changed from you managing those endpoints. So let's kind of continue on with that and let's talk about the security operations team. So one of the one of the items, right, and, and this is particularly, you know, close to me is from a security operations standpoint, how does your security team manage this? How do they manage those endpoints? And do they have the ability to manage those endpoints? And the real question here is, is this stuff that was set up for, you know, temporarily that we didn't fully plan for, or was it actually planned out and we did it properly? So the tools that the security team has to you know have to be able to perform their incident response do they have something on the endpoint because using any kind of incident response tools that reside on the network now remember you're not 
controlling the network. They're at their house. They're across the world. They're distributed. You can't rely on any network-based tools that you might have for any kind of incident response. So obviously that still resides kind of on the endpoint to be able to respond properly to that and get to those endpoints. And the same thing for forensics and artifact recovery, right? There's, there's no walking down the hall when something goes wrong with your system to the security team and be like, something's wrong, right? Or there's no walking down to the IT team and be like, something's wrong. For the IT team, the security team, how do we, right, be able to get access to that system without having to pay to ship it overnight back to the office for us to be able to do whatever we need to do with it, right? That's the challenge that we're now facing is how do we perform our incident response? How do we perform our forensics, our artifact recovery, getting artifacts? Maybe there was some malware that dropped on the system. Well, how do I get that now? Do I have to RDP? Because if I do, that's a little messy because I don't control their network. So is RDP even allowed in? Do I have to set up a, a virtual meeting to be able to get access to their system and allow them to share the system? All these are some of the challenges that were brought apart with 2020 and us going to kind of that distributed workforce. And feel free to obviously drop in any questions, comments, anything that you have in the live chat. I'm watching it on a separate screen and can basically look at that. And I've seen several comments. It's really great to see them in there that employers are looking to go more remote, having somebody work remote and then come into the office as needed. I, that's kind of that remote definition where you're still, you know, three days at home, two days only in the office is a great step forward. That still would be a difference from fully distributed where it's fully a remote employee, remote access. All right, so continuing on, I kind of brought this up before about tech support, right? How does tech support work in this new distributed workforce? What tools and techniques and capabilities do they have to be able to get remote access to systems, right? To be able to push up updates or be able to deploy new applications. All of this, I think has been a challenge for, for ever, right? But the key difference here is when you have that traditional office setting, if I run into an issue of an application install, you know, installation and I have a problem, I walk down to IT and I hand them my desk and I say, here you go. That's as simply as you, you do it. So how does your tech support have that? The, the you know, great question that somebody just brought up is having remote work, is having remote access secure? Remember, you need to get access to that system, whether it's from a security aspect, whether it's from an IT support aspect, you need to be able to get access to that system. And doing so securely, I think, is the biggest challenge that we face. And having a secure way to be able to get access to those systems, be able to assist and perform those actions are the challenges that we have to come over. So that's kind of all I wanted to say about tech support. I, I, I love them to death. They are amazing individuals. I love the team that I work with. They always help me as much as I can. But if your system's not set up for that, for being able to manage using some application management tool to deploy those things, it's it can be a problem and it can cause issues. So now this goes back to uh, a little history lesson on me. I first started on the network side and I'm a firm believer that before you get into the security side, you should definitely understand the networking side. You should understand how networks work, what they do, how your packets get from one location to another before you understand how to secure them. So the one that I'll bring up here is, is the network VPN. And really to split or not to split is the question. So I'm gonna throw this out there. Does anybody know like the difference between a split versus a true tunnel? And my other question would be, do you know what your organization uses, right? Because we hear this all the time and I'm sure you've dealt with it in some kind of security awareness training where it's a, if you're gonna get on a public Wi-Fi or if you're gonna be traveling, make sure you use the VPN right? Use the VPN, use the VPN. So the, the key thing is, right, if it's a split tunnel, for those who don't know, I'll go ahead and kind of draw it out. But if we have, you know, end user at home on their system, and then we have our office over here, right, a true VPN tunnel will send all your traffic 
to the office and then out to the cloud, to whatever they're accessing, right? There's great things about this. That is the idea of a full tunnel. All the traffic goes through that tunnel. It goes through your corporate network. And then all those corporate resources that you had can be used, right? Any kind of IDSs, IPSs, any filtering, proxying, all that now becomes open. However, when you're talking about a distributed workforce and thousands of employees that are all connecting remotely and pushing all their traffic through that tunnel, you can quickly overrun that tunnel. And one option for a lot of organizations was to go to a split tunnel. Now, a split tunnel, the only thing that occurs is anything work or internal. So any internal resources will go through the tunnel. Everything else goes right out from the end user system to the cloud, which means when you told them, hey, when you're on a public Wi-Fi and you want to make sure that you use the VPN, if they're on a split tunnel, then they're really not protected. It's that false sense of security. Can't tell you how many you know, peers I've talked to who are like, oh, well, I just do that on my work computer because it's secure. I just use the VPN and all the network resources or all the resources are protected from the corporate side. And it's kind of that false sense of security, right? I walk into a bank and I feel secure because there's an armed security guard there. I know that they are hired to protect you know, the bank and the, the patrons that are inside of it, but I wouldn't feel as secure if I knew that that security guard wasn't actually carrying a weapon or didn't have any kind of training. So it's that false sense of security when we just tell them, oh, use the VPN when you're remote or when you're on public Wi-Fi and everything is good. If you're using a split tunnel, then obviously that's not gonna help them for any traffic other than what's designated for the actual internal corporate network. So really it's important to understand whether the tunnel is actually split or not when you're talking about a VPN. And you should educate your staff on that. This will be one of the big points that I'll bring up when we talk about the you know, end user security is explaining that you have a split tunnel. There's nothing wrong with that, right? I get the bandwidth understanding. The last thing you want is all of your individuals at work who are on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, pushing all that traffic through the corporate network. It's not meant to handle that coming inbound. Because the key difference when you talked about the individuals being in the office, then the traffic was just going outbound. But coming in through a tunnel, it has to come in, then go out, then come back in, and then go back to them. So again, you can just decimate your bandwidth by trying to do this through a tunnel. So the network VPN, again, to split, not to split, that is the question. I think that's really a great point to make, especially as your organization thinks about distributed workforce and which one of those makes sense for you. There might be some specific users that you may want a full tunnel for. There might be other users that can just make sure that they can make use of a split tunnel. So awesome, excuse me. Uh, great to see a lot of the, the you know, comments and everything else in the live chat and kind of paying attention to it, kind of trying to not lose my train of thought. You're really testing my training capabilities here, my presenting capabilities here, so. Awesome. And yes, you can use a VPN then to get all the other stuff from uh, video streamers that are outside of your region. As somebody brought up in the chat. So the next part I'm gonna talk about is network IP addresses. And you might think like, why would I care about network IP addresses? All right, so the first one is RFC 1918. For anybody who doesn't know, this really ties right back to that VPN access. And this kind of goes to more of your technical end users. So the technical users, you know, most, most end users when they're on network IP addresses and the challenges that they face is when your corporate network is using some IP scheme and then your end user, right, at their home or if they're in a hotel or they're wherever is also on that same scheme. Right, and I hopefully they're not using a slash eight, but the idea with the VPN access is you should educate your users on what IP address schemes you have so you know what not to do on their home networks. Otherwise you will get routing issues because according to them, all that traffic stays local. It doesn't go across the VPN for that. So that is a, a network IP address issue specifically around the actual VPN access. 
So just make note of that. The other one that I'll comment on is IPv6. And I'm gonna go ahead and quiz everybody here. So does anybody know when Microsoft started to support IPv6? Does anybody know, feel free to use the live chat. When did Microsoft start to support IPv6? Which operating system? And I couldn't believe it when I was told this, when I was learning networking in IPv6. So it was actually Windows XP Service Pack 3 was when they fully released IPv6 on a Microsoft operating system. Uh, they might've done server around the same time, but the reason for that is like, that's in the 90s that they supported IPv6, right? So IPv6 has been around since then. And the reason I bring this up is how many of you run IPv6 inside of your corporate network? Right? If you don't run it inside of your corporate network, why do you have it enabled? And the reason for this is most of your ISPs now. Remember from a networking perspective for this remote distributed workforce, most of them are using their home internet. So they're using some ISP and most of those ISPs will issue out IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. And so whether you wanted it or not, right? Your device, your corporate device, unless you've changed it, might pull an IPv6 address, right? Which might confuse everybody because it has letters and numbers in it, but they might use an IPv6 address. Well, the key thing is in IPv6, they have a global IPv6 address, which means it is globally routable, right? And because it is globally routable, that means that device simply only relies on its endpoint firewall. Right, it is connected. That is that global IPv6 address is reachable everywhere. So that's one of the key things that somebody might not have thought about when you went to this distributed workforce. When we were forced our hand to kind of have employees distribute because of COVID, did you think about IPv6? You may not have ran it inside of your corporate network. However, your home user might have their ISP that even gives it to them, whether they like it or not. And chances are they won't even know if they do. So just another challenge that you might see is now if your devices are getting IPv6 addresses, which are publicly routable, right? Global public IP addresses, that is something that you need to make sure that you're aware of and that you make accommodations for, right? Either removing it or deciding what you can and cannot do on those systems. So great point there. Let's move on. Uh, the next part I want to kind of discuss are the challenges that you faced. And this one is probably one of the biggest challenges faced with a distributed workforce. And that is you don't have access to control the network anymore, right? You're relying on this end user buying from their ISP access to the network to be able to get an IP address, to be able to route the traffic back to you through the VPN, connect to the SaaS, to the cloud, to be able to do whatever they need to do. You lose right, your ability to manage that network. So all those firewall rules that you put inside of your firewall at the corporate headquarters, no longer valid. Any filtering, routing, no longer valid for that home user system. And the key thing is since you can't control the network firewall anymore, the only firewall you can rely on is the endpoint firewall. And so managing that endpoint firewall becomes the challenge. How do you manage the firewall on the endpoint, right? Are you using GPO to push out policy to then update it? Are you using other configuration management tools because you lost access to the network to be able to filter any of the firewall stuff, right, from the DMZ? The other one that I'll talk about, and this one hits, hits close to home, and this is DNS. And the reason I say it's close to home is because when I started on the network side, I love networking, went through several different Cisco certifications, all the way up to CCNP routing and switching, loved it, loved getting in there. And then I started finding out about all the network-based attacks, whether it was DNS poisoning, DHCP spoofing, just tons of different network-based attacks on the switches, using mirror ports, 
you know, opening up Wireshark, throwing it into a, a promiscuous mode, capturing all those packets, all that is really what like kind of piqued my interest into the security realm. So the key thing about the network and routing is DNS. What are they using for their DNS server and do they even know? Did you configure your systems to be able to statically use something like a public DNS server? Or are you relying on each individual end user, right? Those distributed workforce to have their network with whatever DNS server their ISP provides for them. So if you wanted to control any of the DNS, that is something else for you to think about because you're now relying on ISPs, DNS servers to manage it. And being able to detect if there is any kind of DNS spoofing or DNS poisoning now becomes a concern that you have to bring up because you no longer control the DNS for them. Uh, so restricted access, this is kind of my next uh, big point of making sure that if there are critical systems that you have that need restricted access. A lot of times I think about backend systems, backend configuration for clouds, things like that, maybe administrative tools that have to run or engineering resources. So it's maybe some resource that engineering has access to. And some of these might be internal to your organization, which is great. You can authenticate, you can make sure that you have them go through. That's awesome. However, if these are all cloud-based, one of, well, let me propose this to the you know, group. How do you control somebody's access to these when they reside in the cloud? Maybe this is a hinting at the whole cloud security thing coming up in a couple of weeks. How do most organizations secure additionally access to these systems, right? They might use single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, things like that. But the real question is, what can they use to make sure that only their systems from their corporate come in? Well, they can specifically approve their own IP addresses. If we know at the actual corporate headquarters, right, that we have the public IP address of, and I'm going to put a private IP address. Yes, I understand that. But if we know that we have, you know, dot two through four as our public IP addresses from the corporate, then inside of our cloud product, we can say, okay, only allow from these IP addresses that are coming from the actual IP addresses from the corporate headquarters. Well, again, restricted access, you can no longer use this type of approving specific IP addresses coming in from there to get access to those systems. Because where are they coming from? Well, they're gonna be from their ISP, wherever they were getting up into those systems. So either way, just want to make sure that you make note that restricted systems, obviously multi-factor authentication, any kind of you know, single sign-on, supporting, making sure that they have the rights to get there. However, once you get there, if you did any kind of approved listing specific IP addresses coming from the corporate to make sure that it's coming from a specific location, that's again where that VPN comes into play and making sure that all that traffic is pushed through. And a lot of tools have started to take a look at this. Uh, and a lot of products have started to take a look at the access and what privileges are they coming in with and what permissions and what access and what are they accessing. And there's a lot of great tools around to help with that cloud access. So the cloud resources, this kind of ties back to the last one. Just make sure is, you know, it's just someone else's hardware. That's all that a cloud resource is that is running for you. Same kind of last slide applies here where make sure that you just know how they're accessing it, what they're accessing, and when they're ask it, or accessing it. Kind of wrap up the like challenges that we face with a distributed workforce and how you can solve these or what things do you look at for solving them. I am not a salesperson. I am not a here for like marketing. Like I just wanna talk tech and the challenges we faced and my thoughts and processes of how we secure them and how we help protect those, those endpoints. Because that's ultimately the goal of every security individual is to secure the things that we're responsible for. So obviously on the endpoint, there's some kind of endpoint protection, whatever that means, whether it's an antivirus, whether it's a you know, next generation antivirus or whatever other kind of controlling of what applications and what things can run on the endpoint. Making sure that it resides on the endpoint is the key here. Firewall management, again, because your distributed workforce is outside of your network control, you need to make sure that you're able to control the firewall on that endpoint. Whether you're using group policy to do so or whether you get a specific product out there that can do it for you, 
the idea is that you just want to make sure that you're still tracking that and able to manage it. So the network inspection here, this is really tied to being able to take a look at the data. What is going in and out of the system? Uh, this kind of touches on DLP, data loss prevention. I didn't really talk about it, but if you have a distributed workforce who needs to print things or needs to get things printed out, are they tying into their home printer? Now, are you tracking what they're printing? All right, that's a whole nother situation that you can bring up of what kind of data are they printing because your company is still responsible for the storage and destruction of that data. So network inspection, any kind of what is being exfiltrated out, are you able to see if there was any kind of DNS poisoning and them reaching out to additional systems, them reaching out to resources they shouldn't? Because you, do, you again, can't have all the traffic pushed to your corporate unless you're doing a full tunnel. You need to make sure that that network inspection or that network view is on the endpoint. Device management, this is a big umbrella, a big, huge point, being able to manage you know, what applications, updates, things like that. Plenty of tools out there that help you manage your endpoints easily, readily, uh, and make sure that they're all getting the updates when they can. And then last but not least, identity management, some kind of single sign-on will go leaps and bounds of helping your security posture by forcing individuals to at least have multi-factor authentication and then everything else go through some kind of single sign-on location. Uh, it takes some work to get going, but that is a great way to actually secure that. And then that gives you the control. What are they accessing with what permissions and what levels to make sure that they're coming in with the proper permissions? All right, so now let's kind of change gears for, I left about 10 minutes in for question and answer or anything you wanted to, to bring up. Plus it's a training fact that after about 40 to 50 minutes of the same thing, you know, you kind of go into a coast mode. So I don't want to take up the full hour, but let's talk about the security awareness changes that this is Ryan's opinion, we should focus on in 2021, right? So we wanna make sure that when we talk about security awareness, that we update for what we're seeing currently. We update for the new situations that we've put this distributed workforce in. So this is where I, I ask all of you in the live chat, there's tons of activity in there. Name a security awareness topic. Maybe name your favorite security awareness topic, maybe name your most dreaded security awareness topic. Just give me a security awareness topic. All right, so ransomware was thrown up there. Ransomware again, um, insider threat, awesome. All right, so insider threat. Ransomware, somebody did put up phishing. This is where you get to see where my uh, training sloppy handwriting comes into play as I try and keep up. Uh, phishing, social engineering. Employee training, password. All right, passwords, awesome. Really some great suggestions. Burnout, uh, I think that probably should be a topic specifically for your security team. Uh, yes, somebody did finally bring up one of my favorites, tailgating. All right, so lots of them. This is just a sample. Thanks everybody for your participation in here. Zoom hacks was another great one. Awesome, so definitely, I think, and awesome, because I didn't even think about that. So that's really great because that probably should have been a slide on mine, but it's not for virtual, you know, conferencing, virtual, just security of all the tools that you're using. So thanks everybody for your participation in there. I kind of came up with my own list of just general topics, but we'll gladly talk about some of yours. So generally they cover things like compliance. Compliance, maybe some privacy that you have, uh, passwords or authentication, that includes multi-factor authentication, data storage and data destruction. That's really important when you talk about how long are we supposed to keep data and what are we supposed to do with data when we're done keeping it, specifically around compliance when you get back to things like GDPR or other compliance or, or other restrictions around what you can and cannot have. Tailgating, piggybacking, like love that topic, but I have seen so many trainings about that that it's just ridiculous. Uh, badging slash physical security, social media, uh, public unsecure Wi-Fi. I, I think this is maybe not as important unless people are still going to coffee shops or things like that to get some work done. But even 
the security that you'll see with ISPs. So home router security, to me, is a topic that needs to come up as part of like Wi-Fi security. And then social engineering. So this is just way limited view on some of the different security topics that have been out there in the world. So these need to be updated. Obviously, for, for where we're at now with the distributed workforce, some of these are going to be more important than others, right? Tailgating and piggybacking, I'm pretty sure is not going to be the focus of 2021 security awareness training. I am pretty sure that your end users, right, those people that are working remotely or the distributed workforce is going to be even more vigilant to not let people tailgate or piggyback into their own homes. So I really don't think you need to like reinforce that a ton, but that's going to bring up some new topics. You know, obviously securing your home or securing your badges because so many of your employees will still have a badge if they have to come back into the office. So then talk about what is that badge? How should you secure it? Things like that. So that probably shouldn't be the focus of 2021 security awareness training. I understand it's there because once you go back to the office, that is still a concern, still something you want them to be aware of, but should get less focus in 2021. Somebody brought this up and, and I said I was going to bring it back up. Teach them about VPNs, right? VPNs is a false sense of security unless you explain to them exactly what you're doing, whether you're split or whether you're full. Because without that, they get that false sense of security of I can just do whatever I want. It's going through the corporate network and all the things there are going to protect me. Remember, these are most of your end users, right? That aren't really gonna understand the security threats or the security things they're talking about. And they just assume I'm on the VPN, I'm secure, right? And every VPN out there claims that like, oh, use our VPN and you can do everything securely. It's like, it's not necessarily true. Uh, it does give you a whole lot more security, but depending on how it's configured. So really teach them about your VPNs, teach them what a VPN is, why they should use it. Another big thing that I think is important in this time is ransomware is on the rise. We'll talk more about that later, but ransomware is up there. However, if they're connected via the VPN back to the corporate network and have things like map drives, then if their permissions state they can and they're connected to that remote drive, then it will also hit that remote drive for ransomware if it's set to do so. So understanding only use the VPN when you need it. Don't use it when you don't need it. You know, if you have an employee who only accesses cloud resources, you're using Office 365, you're using Salesforce, you're using other things that are all up in the cloud. They only need the VPN when they have to do VPN things. They shouldn't stay attached to it all the time. So just another way to teach them about the VPNs, when to use it, what to use it for, right? And then the things about mapping drives with that. So moving on from there, I'm gonna kind of pose this to the team here. Is distributed workforce different for data storage and data destruction? So what do you think? Is distributed different when it comes to data storage and data destruction? I had kind of talked about this earlier when we mentioned that, you know, for some end users, they have to print things. Since they're not in a corporate headquarters, they might use their home printer. I keep pointing over here because that's where my printer is. So. I'm being very animated as I, I do normally when I train, but do they need to print out things? And if they are, normally instead of a corporate headquarters, you might have the shred bin where we go put things to get shredded and destroyed properly when we print out those documents. Is that something that you need to be concerned about? I think so if you have them printing, but you need to now make sure that they have the appropriate shredder or know that they have to bring those back in for the shredder. So, to me, this is something that you should bring up in your security awareness training. If you're allowing them to print things, if you're allowing them to have data at home, use removable media, things like that, then definitely data destruction, data storage come up. And especially there's no longer maybe a safe or a secure place that you can put them at the, at the corporate headquarters. So what, what is your recommendation for them? Right? What do they have at their home? So, just wanted to, to mention that one of distributed being different for data storage, data destruction, depending on your risk and what you have or have not allowed for those distributed workforce to actually be able to do. Public Wi-Fi. So this one will come up less about the like, hey, if you're on public Wi-Fi, use a VPN, but more on the, if you're on a public Wi-Fi, just things to look out for. 
just understand that what public Wi-Fi is and if it's unsecured, what that really means, even if it's secured. The key reason I bring up secured here is a lot of ISPs, all right, I won't name any, but a lot of ISPs are now taking and adding up where they're creating this net of data, right? Where you can be one of their customers and you can go anywhere and you can get access to the internet. So they need to understand what are the security risks that come with having configured to automatically join those networks no matter where they go. Because at that point, right, they're still gonna be having their traffic pass through something. If somebody set up a, an access point, just called it the same thing and they joined, again, understanding the, the security risks that come with wireless and if they have that kind of thing at their home. So just wanted to bring up that that definitely is a concern of mine, you know, with this distributed workforce on what networks are they connecting to. It's easy when they walk into the corporate headquarters, put their laptop down, connect to the Wi-Fi there, no big deal. But when they start connecting to hotels or to public Wi-Fi, have those saved network settings, it makes it a little bit more difficult and things that they need, you need to address, right? And educate the end users on of why things they should look for. Phishing technology allows attackers to master phishing easily without great effort. I like to real fish and it's hard. And sometimes I come up empty. I like to think that attackers who fish Technology has given them leaps and bounds, a greater ability to make sure that they land a fish more often than I do when I go to the lake. So fishing will always be a concern. Fishing will always be an issue. And certain situations this year brought that up and it became more prevalent as an attack surface because of different things. So this should be reinforced, especially for the amount of ransomware that came through it and the amount of other things that have come through those phishing attacks and how successful they have been. So just wanted to bring that one up. That one's not really anything anybody needs to know, right? Kind of want to start to close out with show them something. A great philosophy that I have is don't tell them something, although I'm saying this as I've just talked to you for the past you know, 45 minutes, but show them something. When it comes to security awareness training, I will tell you the day that I, inside of virtual machines, set up a rat and connected to it from a different machine and then was able to manipulate that machine, my eyes were opened. Yeah, I, I will tell a story with this one is, I remember back in high school when I was going through driver's ed, uh, they talked about the reaction time, right? If somebody breaks in front of you and your reaction time for you to stop your brakes, how long it takes. And we had a big discussion in class and we talked about it and it was like, I'm good. Like I have the quickest reflexes. I play video games all day. When I see Mario falling down the hole, like I know and I will solve it. Like tailgating a car is perfectly fine. I'm gonna know when they're gonna break and I'm gonna be fine. And then it came time for them to bring this car. And the car was pretty cool because it had, for those of us who had our permits, a basically firing mechanism that would fire chalk down at the road. And what it would do is as you were driving, right? We were in the parking lot of the high school, we were driving, it would set off the alarm to let you know that the person in front of you just broke, right? They just put on their brakes and it would shoot chalk into the ground just to mark where the like time that the alert went off. And then when you stepped on the brakes, it showed you another chalk mark. And then when you finally stopped, it showed another chalk mark. And it wasn't until we, right, as kids went out there and saw like, I don't have quick reflexes. When you're driving 40 miles an hour, split seconds count. So it was that visualization that has always stuck with me on how I thought I was gonna do versus what I actually did when it came to that. And so rather than talk to your end users about phishing attacks, show them something, right? Set up some VMs. I'm pretty sure that most organizations have personnel that have the security chops to be able to just set up a simple phishing attack, just set up a macro to open up calculator, do something. Right, set up a VM to be able to get remote access and then drop something on the virtual machine and just record it. Use a screen recording software and just show them how easy it is for an attacker to land an attack. And then on the opposite side, show them your products, show them whatever security tools you use and how they see it and what they see. And that way, the next time that end user clicks on all the things and they say, I don't know, it just happened, 
you can say, look, our security training video showed us click through five different prompts that said, are you sure you wanna open this? Are you sure you're sure you wanna open this? If you enable this feature, it might reduce the security of your device. So I'm a firm believer that as an organization for this coming year and in the future, show your end users, right? Security is not some gigantic, huge security topic that nobody can figure out, right? I'm sure your end users will appreciate seeing what us as the security professionals do, what we have to deal with, and then just have that visibility into it. So show them something. Some ones that I would suggest, show them a phishing attack, whether it's a macro enabled Excel, excuse me, Excel coming through Outlook, whether it's a, a changed hyperlink, something like that inside of a, an email, just to show them this is what it actually looks like in person. Right? I hover over it, I see the difference. Don't just show them pictures, show them videos of this happening. If you get that remote access from that macro, show them the remote access, show them what you can do on that Kali box, show them the controls that they have, right? Just do it in a controlled environment, show them ransomware, show them what it does and how fast it occurs. Like people don't understand, computers are pretty fast nowadays. It doesn't take a ton of time for it to start encrypting lots of files. And then also the Wi-Fi attacks. So they understand the public, you know, just set up a Wi-Fi and have some other device connect to it and show them what that looks like and what you can see once you're connected to that secure device. So that is the things I would show if I had the ability to give it all to you, I would. But things like that are would really resonate, in my opinion, with the actual end users to understand and see it rather than just talk about, don't click on all the things, right? Microsoft, unfortunately, has been teaching everybody since the days of UAC, click on all the things for it to actually open. So even if it's 20 prompts, click on all the things to get what you actually want, all right? So kind of main takeaway, a distributed workforce brought about unique changes to traditional security, right? Adapt to the changes, educate your staff accordingly is my main takeaway from this. I, I hope that you were able to learn something, at least think about something in a different way, Welcome to my mind, it's crazy, I know, I apologize, but really I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to join me on this session, uh, to, to listen to my presentation, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'll kind of open it up, any questions? Normally in training I say questions, comments, concerns, complaints, I may or may not have an answer, I am human after all. Nerd question, right? Somebody wants to know what I was using to draw on the presentations in real time, so for Windows, it's called Zoomit. It's actually a system internals tool, uh, a system internals tool, so Zoomit. So just search Zoomit, you'll pull it from Microsoft's page. It allows me to draw on it. I can change colors to go to green. I can draw pretty pictures like a big tree, what have you. I was wondering what that was. <laughs> yeah, it's Zoom It, and it basically turns your entire screen. And what I also have is, for anybody asking, I have a Wacom tablet. So I have a full drawing tablet that I use, so I can see exactly. That's why you've seen me look down every time I draw. Apologies that you get to look at my balding head, <laughs> but I have the drawing tablet that I draw on to be able to make things a little bit more engaging. Zoom It basically just gives me a clear screen over everything, so I can draw on slides, web pages, anything. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. I have, a, I have a quite lengthy question, so bear with me. It's about surveys. Uh, what approach would you take when corporate wants to survey employees using a third party, but the messaging contradicts security training? You explain the reasoning for not doing surveys, but leadership still wants to do it, stating it supports product service line development. And so let me tackle that in two ways. One, surveys are best when they're actually open-ended questions, not a rate me with a one through five. You will get the best feedback by asking open-ended questions. So it might not be bad to use surveys to ask open-ended questions, asking them about security topics to see how relevant it was or how much they were able to uh, get out of it. On the opposite side, if it goes against security policies, unfortunately, I am one of those who's been in management and understands the checkbox for a compliance or the checkbox for something. I don't necessarily support it, but I understand it is a part of the world that we live in where I have to check a box somewhere to, to say that I did something. Mm. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. 
Any other questions as we're wrapping up? We've got about seven minutes, so no question is um, too light or too heavy. Ask away. Quite a bit back, there was a, a question about split tunneling, uh, and someone was wondering if you had any recommendations on how to kind of get up to speed on split tunneling, VPN, and deployments, if there's any websites or, or papers you might recommend for that. I went through years of Cisco training, <laughs> I'll have to. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll take a look um, and just see what I can see what I can find if there's anything good out there. I, I know I've used LinkedIn Learning before, so I'll take a look out there. But yeah, it's definitely one of the harder topics to talk about because it is that like mind blown type of approach of like, what do you mean my traffic's going this way versus that way? So I'll I'll take a gander um, if I can find anything, and then I'll I'll share it with the team, or I'll come back into the live chat and and drop in any kind of resources I'm able to find. Let me make note before I forget. Turn into my old man and forget everything that I said. So somebody did ask, what are your your thoughts on DNS security in endpoint view? From a DNS perspective, uh, DNS poisoning is one of the easiest ways that you can get somebody to a site that you don't want them to. So I would say from a security endpoint, are you watching the host file? Are you making sure that nobody or other systems are not able to change the host file location? I mean, that's what it's gonna use locally to resolve before it jumps to an actual DNS server. Normally from a corporate standpoint, I would make sure that you're only allowing UDP 53 to your specific DNS server to make sure that there's no kind of DNS uh, hijacking or DNS poisoning going on. From an end user, when you get to this distributed network, that was one of the, things I brought up of is a little bit more complicated because most of them are going to use whatever the ISP has for their DNS, right? They don't know any different. So generally from an endpoint view, you can use, I think it's Sysmon, which you can then pull, put on the device and then be able to pull all the DNS queries that it makes or look to a security tool that actually pulls whatever network connections they make. From a DNS perspective, I'm always a fan of, I'd rather be more concerned about what did they actually connect to versus what did they resolve? Just because, just because a device makes a DNS resolution request doesn't mean that they actually connected out to it. While that's weird that it'll make a request and not connect out to it, the network connections that they're actually making are the things to me that are more important. One question, uh, wouldn't it just be easier to ship all of your employees a managed router to add to their network? So it, it could but now you're introducing complexities that your team then has to manage, right? Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, a non-technical user who set up their router, who set up their connection back to whatever ISP they had, probably wasn't them, or if it was, it was on some little app that gave you like three options. Like, do I want secure, really <laughs> secure, or very secure, right? You have no understanding what it did, what it opened from a firewall point of view, but now you need to realize that if you send that to somebody, you now have to kind of help them walk through, whether it's setting their modem to bridge mode, be able to have that acting as your router, getting that IP address and setting that up. It is definitely a solution. And for some of your like full VPN solutions, that's what some of the organizations will do is they send out basically the client that will connect back to that server for the VPNs. And it basically just takes all their network traffic and just routes it across. So then everything is secure and it's using that connection. That ties into a question uh, the, from another user that, that works basically, have you run into privacy versus security issues as you're attempting to access work from home? Uh, well, people in the people out of the office, I guess it would be in this case. Right, and, and it's definitely with the last question, right? If you send them a router to use, now all their traffic's going through that router, right? Now it's a corporate asset that belongs to the company. Now, does that technically fall into the company can monitor that, can look at that traffic versus the you know, home computer that you have or the computer that you have that then rides across that connection where it's just the connection point. So I believe it does bring up that concern, um, but most of those type of devices, if, a, if an organization gives you the router, it's now acting as that managed device that is more of a pass-through. So from the networking perspective, it's not setting up a new network. If you set it up more as a pass-through device, then it can control just coming from your work computer or work system. But I mean, on that point, why not take a little bit of time, educate your staff if they wanted to understand what their router does and walk them through some of the different options that some of the ISPs have. And a big thing there too is, I forget what vendor it was, but there were supposedly thousands of different ISP routers that were all vulnerable 
because it's on the end user to still update. And so you're it's now having your network traffic passing through right. a vulnerable network device and that brings up risk. So there's a lot of things that you might want to kind of change to walk them through or maybe offer up a, hey, this is how you do it or hey, take some time. Make sure that you're updating your devices on the network. Right, and I just want to say there's been some comments about the bow tie. <laughs> Everyone loves it. Um, so th this is my Ghostbusters bow tie. Uh, you can thank my wife. She is amazing and makes most of my, uh, as I call it, my nerd bow ties, my Ghostbusters, my Super Mario, my Zelda. She does most of those bow ties for me to, to embrace my inner nerd. <laughs> Someone posted a... Um, an Etsy store where people are selling Ghostbuster bow ties. So maybe your wife can look into a little, little side hustle. <laughs> I, I'm I'm sure right now she'd like to stick to her regular full time job, <laughs> and, and just do this more as a a thing for me. Just for you, yeah. <laughs> just for all me and friends, you know. Yeah. I don't think she'd want to turn it full time. Yeah. No, my wife does not have an Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> This is unrelated, but a lot of people are asking about the SOC class. And it is it is full for our December run. But we will be offering it again February 2nd through 5th. I'm not sure that it's on the website, but we should have that up here shortly in case you have any, in case you'd like to register. Uh, it is a pay what you want class. So uh, just an FYI on that. And you know what, Ryan? I'm seeing some really awesome response here to your talk today. So thank you so much for being part of this or, or putting this together and speaking for us today on this hacking cast. My, my pleasure. Absolutely happy to do it. All right. Well, I, I got some dates. I will have some dates for June and uh, again in September. Uh, I'd love to have you come on out and be part of our Wild West Hacking Fest as well. Awesome. Would love to. If everybody will have me, I'll be there. <laughs> Absolutely. Bring your bow ties. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. And some, someone is wanting We can sell them. <laughs> okay. I like it. That's good. Uh, we do have one just random question about your fish tank. They would like to know a little bit of details about your background. <laughs> so, so fun fact about Ryan, uh, I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. And if you've ever seen the show Taint on Animal Planet that does all the big saltwater aquariums, I used to work there. I wanted to be oh, wow. uh, a marine biologist when I when I grew up. So I've always had saltwater aquariums since I was back in high school. Um, so this is a saltwater reef aquarium, which is a couple of clownfish, a couple of anemones in it. I've had them for years, but it has been my passion, my, my love outside of security for as long as I can remember. So everywhere I go, I try and get to an aquarium or get to, to somewhere to enjoy the ocean and enjoy all of it. It's supposed to like reduce stress. I don't know, maybe it's cause it's behind me and I'm never looking at it, that it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <but laughs> or how high of level stress would you have without it? Like, I, I know, right? Think about it that way. <laughs> well, you know, I'm thinking marine biologist, cybersecurity. Yeah, one and the same. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> oh, especially wanting to be a marine biologist in the middle of the desert. Like uh, that right, one didn't yeah. work to me. Either. I, I don't know. So now it's just become a, a love, a passion of mine to be able to, oh. to have aquariums and and be able to look at the fish and I have cats. I think I heard one during the presentation. Hopefully it didn't get too much on the microphone, but they love to just sit there and look at it too. Like dinner is just right out of their reach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is awesome. Thank you, Ryan, again, for joining us. Thank you all for, um, for sticking around and uh, asking good questions with that. I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Velda, if you, you know, any final words. Um, no. Thank you for attending. We look forward to seeing you on our next one. Hopefully, you'll sign up for the Roundup next week, Cloud Roundup. Check out our website at uh, wildwesthackingfest.com for all the updates. Q1 training is posted. Yay. Yay. That's awesome. All right, guys. <laughs> I am going to end for all. Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you guys on the next Hacking Cast. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone.